down here in Old Man Willoughby's shack making my first video for the internet. Yeah, I know I read all those letters, but that was for candy. I can make my own videos for the internet with this here smartphone. My sister got it for me, much to the chagrin of my brother-in-law, Scott. I don't know what an unlimited data plan is or why it gets Scott so bent out of shape, but I sure do like jilling off to those videos of Puddle's pity party. <laughs> He's got this rendition of I want you to want me that just incites my proclivity. My sister got me this device because she's worried about me. She thinks I'm getting a bit long in the tooth and, and she's always spouting flummery like, you're very vulnerable. And I know she's probably right, but see, I take precautions. First of all, I always travel with my horn. <laughs> I can sound an alarm and I never travel alone. I've got my sidekick Zooterkins, right? You've got my back, Zoot. All right. And if all else fails, should any ne'er-dwellers try to assault my personage, I've always got this coupon here. It's for a lap dance at the Booby Bungalow, and I can just shuck it at him and run. Now back to the task at hand. For years, I have collected all my stories, poems, premonitions, and fables in a beautiful leather-bound journal. Last fall, I was bunking at my favorite junkyard, and while I was out rambling, Rosie the junkyard dog got into our stash, and she ripped my leather journal to slobbery shreds. But I can't blame Rosie. No, she was just acting on her nature. No, I blame Zerkins. That's right. You were supposed to be watching the stash. And don't give me any of those lame excuses about how you're an inanimate object who needs a hand up your hoo-ha to come to life. Anyway, with this smartphone, I can record anything I want and upload it to the World Wide Web for posterity. To that end, I present the love letter. Years ago, when I was passing through Hoboken, I came into possession of this copy of Madame Bovary. And within it, I found a letter. Now, I'm a bit clairvoyant. And upon touching this letter, I was struck with a vision. In my mind's eye, a girl about 12 years old, quiet and shy, a bit of a wallflower by all outward appearances, but well-read and full of venturesome fancy. She was standing next to her grandmother, a woman about in her 70s, with a blue-flowered mumu and curly gray hair. They were standing in the pews of a church, the scent of sandalwood and spice in the air. They entered the aisles and began walking towards the back of the church. Megan, that was the girl's name, started looking longingly toward the back of the church at the arched entryway. Megan had heard stories from her grandmother about a sneaky pair of teenagers that long ago used to go into that courtyard behind the church to hold hands and kiss. And later they got married and they traveled from Budapest to Buenos Aires and they had eight children and went on generally to live happily ever after until death did them part after 75 years of married bliss. And it was this snippet of mythos that Megan held as exemplary of a life best lived. And she longed for such legendary romance. Three years later, Megan fell in love with a boy named Jason. At first, they were just good pals. He wasn't smitten with her yet, mostly because he hadn't matured into that age of sensual desire. But by the time they were both 17, he was as in love with her as she was with him. And unfortunately, he was just as shy and afraid to confess his feelings. Those two would-be lovebirds just circled around each other until the end of high school. And then Megan was going to go off to Case Western Reserve. And, and Jason was going to go off to Ohio University. And those two schools are over a three-hour drive apart. 
The closest they ever came to confessing their love for each other was the night before Megan went off to college. They were sitting on a bench in the gazebo of their town square. You couldn't imagine a more romantic setting. And the two of them just sat there thinking about holding the other's hand or more daringly about leaning in for a kiss. But neither of them did. Afterward, they both just figured they'd meet other people in college. But they ended up talking on the phone every week. And after a couple months of that, Megan decided she'd had enough. And she decided to pour all her feelings into this letter. <coughs> Dear Jason, this letter is long overdue. You're the best friend I've had in the world. There's no one else that I can talk to about everything from Plato's Apology to our favorite episodes of The Twilight Zone. But when I search my heart, I know that you're more than a friend to me. For the past four years, I've ached to hold you and feel your warm body against mine. I'm completely in love with you, and I'm kicking myself for not finding a way to tell you sooner. At first, I was afraid that you weren't interested, but then I thought you were, and I waited for you to make a move. I know a long-distance relationship would be challenging, but if you're willing to give it a go, I am too. Yours, Meg. Well, now she didn't mail the letter. She gave it to Jason's cousin who also went to Case and figured he could drop it off at Thanksgiving. And she sent it along with this book that she'd borrowed from Jason and a, and a pamphlet about summer volunteer opportunities. And she, she taped the letter to the book right there. But the, the, the tape came off. And Megan's cousin put the letter in the book, like that. Well, after he'd received the package, Jason called Meg right away. And she, she was just, just, just quivering as she held the receiver. This is before cell phones. And she's, she's all nervous. And she was hoping he would talk first. But he just offered some casual howdy-do. So finally, after some nervous pause, she said, Oh. Did you get my message? And Jason answered. Oh uh, yeah, I appreciate it. But uh, I, I don't think I'm interested. And Megan, utterly broken hearted, said, oh. Taken aback by her sad tone of voice and silence, Jason further offered. I mean, I just don't want to close off any of my options, but maybe next year. Megan's sadness expanded into full-blown humiliation. And she mustered up all the dignity she could to say, I understand. Don't give it another thought. Of course, Jason never read the letter. He thought the message was that brochure about summer volunteer opportunities. Now, the letter stayed in the book for 25 years. And then it got donated to Goodwill. Oh, Zooterkins quit crying. She probably got married and had like five kids and lived happily ever after with somebody else or something. Whatever.